So welcome everyone. My name's Scott Hanson. I'm the Director General with New South Wales Department of Prime Industries. Um, and I'm going to be trying to steer traffic here this afternoon. Um, firstly, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all come to us from today. In my case, Wiradjuri land here in the Central Tablelands and pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules this afternoon. We have representatives from key farming, key research and industry players who have gathered to help talk through how we might work together to manage a potential spring surge in mouse numbers across New South Wales. Um, we're going to shortly hear from Minister Marshall, who's joining us live from Moree, um, and then we'll throw across to our industry panellists. Um, I think up in the chat, uh, you'll see the instructions there from our moderator, uh, Camilla, who will be helping um, guide questions to panellists um, through the Q&A function of the Zoom platform. Um, we'll be taking as much time to answer those as we can throughout the course of this next hour. Um, but we'll also be making sure that we come back to all attendees via email later this week with a summary of all the questions and any further information um, and answers that we have for you. Uh, this is a public forum and we are we do have a limited amount of time this afternoon, so we want to keep our chat and our discussions focused on mice. Um, there's plenty of other things that will be impacting on our profitability over this coming summer, whether that's trade and trade disruptions or whether that's COVID the COVID disruptions and worker supply. Then the time we have this afternoon, uh, we want to keep focus on mice um, to get as much information and a much uh, two-way exchange of uh, views as possible. So uh, without any further ado, uh, let me first of all introduce Minister for Agriculture and Minister for Western New South Wales, the Honourable Adam Marshall. Thanks very much, Scott. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, from a very uh, cool and windy moree today. Uh, I've had to seek refuge in, uh, in my car. We just got another uh, mass vaccination walk-in clinic here today, but uh, a very good afternoon, especially to all of our panelists, uh, all of our experts that you're gonna hear from this afternoon. Importantly, uh, all of you as, uh, as primary producers right across our state. Um, I don't need to tell you uh, how bad the, uh, the mice numbers were prior to winter. And while winter offered some respite uh, in uh, most parts of our state, uh, we are expecting a very big surge uh, of mice now that conditions, I say that given how cold it is today, but as conditions are, are, are going to warm up and, uh, and conditions uh, generally being absolutely sublime uh, on the ground, uh, particularly in, uh, in, in a cropping sense. So uh, today's forum is, is another opportunity to come together and hear from some of the experts, hear about uh, what's predicted, but also uh, some measures that can be implemented on farm to get, uh, I guess, to optimise uh, on farm and in paddock baiting programs. And of course, to take you through the, uh, the various financial support and rebates that are available and on the table right now. Uh, I want to acknowledge in particular the, uh, the support of the, the New South Wales Farmers Association in getting that information out to their members to make sure that people do take advantage of that $150 million package, which is on the table uh, and the support that is available to ameliorate some of those uh, significant costs, which people are going to, to protect a, an absolutely critical and very valuable uh, asset in, uh, uh, in, um, uh, in those crops uh, that, are, uh, that are looking really good. So again, thank you, Scott, uh, your team, local land services, uh, everyone involved and, um, and uh, hopefully we get, we get a lot out of uh, the next hour or so. Thank you. Hi, hey, thanks, Minister. Um, and just before we throw across to Steve Henry from CSIRO, um, I thought it might just be uh, worthwhile quickly covering off on um, a bit of an update of some of those packages that the Minister just referred to there in terms of the assistance packages that are on the table from New South Wales uh, government. Um, the, the first series of packages that were opened up were ones for household and small business rebates. Uh, these were rebates to help cover the costs of mouse control and cleaning for households and small business in regional and rural areas. Um, are available through Service New South Wales. Households are eligible up for $500. Um, small businesses eligible up to $1,000. Um, I believe as of the end of last week, there was close to 25,000 applications um, had been received for the household applications. 
and just under 5,000 applications received for businesses. Um, the zinc phosphide rebates, which were rebates of up to $10,000 uh, to cover 50% of the costs of purchasing zinc phosphide baits, have been available through the New South Wales Rural Assistance Authority. I think that opened up on the 2nd of August. Um, as of the end of last week, we'd had just on 700 applications received um, and obviously a steady stream of applications coming in on that front. Um, so with that quick update, hopefully enough time for Steve to get himself prepared and throw across the person who's been doing more talking about mice in the last 18 months than uh, he probably anticipated. I'll throw it to CSIRO's Steve Henry. Oh, thank you, Scott, and thank you, Minister Marshall. Um, it's great to have the opportunity to speak this afternoon, um, and I believe that there's um, a stack of people dialed in. So, obviously, this is a continuing um, really important issue. I'm just going to share my screen momentarily so that you can, and I'm going to show uh, one slide that I think helps to um, to highlight the reason why we're concerned about mice at the moment um, and certainly going forward um, into spring. So this is a slide of some data that was taken from uh, the Mouse Alert website. Um, and the slide on the left shows from the data records from the start of August 2020, which was basically the inception of the mouse outbreak last year. Uh, through to about four weeks ago. And you can see apart from those, those ones that are, that are clustered around urban centres, that the reports that we're getting in pretty accurately describe the extent of the outbreak. What's concerning for me is the image on the right-hand side of this slide that shows the records from the 1st of May until about three weeks ago. So essentially through the winter period, at a time when we would be expecting to get um, records that reflected zeros or, or no concern about mice at all, you can see that from essentially central Queensland all the way through the main part of the cropping belt in New South Wales, down into Victoria and across into South Australia, we were still getting reports of high numbers or moderate numbers of mice through the winter time. Now that's a cause for real concern for us. Um, so in, in preparing for this presentation, I've spent about the last 48 hours <clears throat> on the phone talking to farmers, which is pretty much uh, uh, my job description over the last year and a half or so, uh, because one of the things that we think is very important as scientists is to be talking to farmers on an ongoing basis and focusing our research efforts on the areas that, that, that farmers think will make a difference to them. Um, so in terms of ringing around farmers to find out what's been going to get a, a summary of the current situation, um, and, and for the purposes of this report, I'll work from north to south, um, starting in Boree, and I hope this uh, coincides with what Minister Marshall's been hearing while he's been up in that country over the last few days. Um, and I'm going to read through it because there's quite a few reports here and I can't remember them all off by heart. So, so for the area to the north of Moree, uh, numbers are increasing around Cropper Creek uh, from low to moderate to high in a very short period of time. So basically over the last two weeks, they've seen a pretty dramatic increase through that area. Um, in the area to the west of the Newell, uh, numbers were patchy until two weeks ago when populations increased dramatically, resulting in increasing baiting effort. Um, the hotspots are associated directly with paddock history. So those paddocks that where the most amount of food was left on the ground, um, either uh, head loss prior to harvest or stuff that's come out the back of the header, have uh, sustained mouse populations through the summer into the winter. And we're now seeing high numbers of mice in those paddocks. Um, Around Gunnada, the reports there were of no significant numbers in that area. I haven't got a lot of contacts through that area, so I'm not 100% sure, but that was one of the areas where the people were reporting that they weren't all that concerned. Although on the Liverpool Plains, which is not basically the same area, 
there were a lot of crops that were sown particularly late because people waited till mouse numbers had declined in the winter time before they sowed their winter crops. So that's a pretty significant measure of a really high degree of concern about the impact that mice could have. Uh, from narrow mine, there are reports of baiting activity in some areas at the moment, again, which is quite early in the spring to be taking those sorts of efforts. Walgett seems to be a, a, a hot spot in the state at the moment with reports of baiting from as far, what, where they started really early in August baiting, which again is, means that sort of, I mean, Walgett might warm up a fair bit earlier than the rest of the state. And so mice might have got active um, a little bit earlier in that area, but they started baiting early in August. They were seeing damage to faber beans. Um, at the moment, there's significant baiting effort from essentially out as far as Lightning Ridge all the way back east across to Burren Junction and then also in areas to the south of Walgett. Um, what the agronomists reported from that area is that farmers that only perimetered baited early are now going back again to do subsequent applications of bait to mop up mice in the centre of the paddock. Whereas those farmers that baited entire paddocks early in the, in the season have found that they've got quite effective control. So that's encouraging, but it means that we need to think quite critically about the way we bait and the way we monitor for mice. Um, it may be that mice aren't moving in from the edges of paddocks the way people think they are. They're actually established out in paddocks and we do need to bait across the entire paddock to get a good result. Um, Talking to farmers around Canambal, uh, particularly to the northwest of Canambal, um, just yesterday I, I called a farmer, he couldn't answer his phone because he was filling his bait spreader. So that indicates that there's plenty of mice there and they're taking action now. He also reported that he'd been talking to a roo shooter who had been using a, an infrared scope, so no light, um, and through a large portion of his uh, pasture around Canamble, they were seeing significant numbers of mice while they were out uh, trying to shoot kangaroos. Um, so that's cause for some concern. And it starts to highlight the role that pastures are playing as a refuge habitat for mice, and maybe the need for future research in that area to try and find ways where we can be more strategic about controlling mice in pastures or making pastures less favourable for mice to, to use. Um, when you head across to Ningen and Trangi, um, there were reports of early baiting efforts around uh, Ningen and Trangi that were quite successful. Um, but again, farmers are baiting around their canola just last week because they were seeing signs of damage to pods in, in developing canola crops. Uh, pushing further south to Griffith, um, just in the last three or four weeks, they're starting to get concerned about mice coming out of refuge habitats and into crops and they're starting to see damage around the edges of cereal crops and that classic kind of damage that is the chewing of nodes, heads falling over, um, essentially white heads developing where they've chewed into the node, the head has stayed standing but is no longer viable, viable. so it actually looks like the crop's been frosted where the mice have been chewing into nodes. Uh, similarly out at Lake Jellico and Hillston, are reporting uh, emerging numbers now and seeing that damage around the edge of crops. Um, and Tottenham, uh, we understand, have been experiencing quite high numbers, have been baiting for about three or four weeks now. Um, around Parks and Forbes, um, farmers are reporting that they're seeing the odd active burrow, um, but they're not seeing any signs of significant damage at the moment. That sort of indicates to me that, you know, that that area is probably a little bit colder. The spring's only just starting to develop now. The crop is still well and truly still in the boot, so it's not emerging yet. And so I would expect that we start to hear signs of damage over the next three or four weeks as the crop develops. Mice certainly haven't disappeared from that area in the way that we would see at the end of a, of a mouse outbreak. Um, again, pushing on down to Grenville, uh, Grenfell, where uh, there are reports of some problems there, but not significant damage at the moment. But again, if we're seeing these sort of early signs of mouse activity, that's cause for some concern for us. Um, 
The good news is from Wagga, Juni, Ganmain, Bori Creek, Collie Amberley, where they're not seeing any signs of damage at the moment. But as you push further south into the Riverina proper, uh, around Daniloquin, Kerrang, Barham, Tokemal, Comrum and Finlay, uh, mice are present, but not in extreme numbers. But baiting is underway in high value irrigated crops to minimise damage in those crops. So canola is, is getting a fair amount of attention at the moment. And certainly there is an underlying population there that's been sustained by summer cropping and some really big rice stubbles that have kept mice viable in the system for longer. And so they're the ones where they're, where they're starting to see damage in these high value irrigated crops at the moment. Um, so I guess in summary, and I'm sort of skipping through to the end as quickly as possible, so we've got time for questions. Um, but we're getting reports from just about the entire cropping area of New South Wales that there are varying levels of mouse activity uh, with average and with average to better than average crops being expected. Um, that's cause for concern for us because those crops will put lots of food, lots of shelter and lead to really favourable conditions for mice and the potential for mice to breed to really high numbers again. So in terms of control strategies, I think for us, um, the key messages are that if you're seeing signs of mice, uh, be prepared to bait early and we're recommending that you use the ZP50 bait. Uh, research that we've done at Parks says that you will get a better result more often using the ZNP50 bait than you will with the existing 25 gram bait. Now, having said that, if you only have option to use the 25, if you can't get the ZP50, use it, but continue to monitor to make sure you've got a good job. Don't just put your bait out and assume that you've got a good result. You need to continue to follow up, continue to walk through your crops, look for those signs of damage. We're recommending that people get out, go for a walk through their crop, look for those classic signs of damage, chewed nodes, chewed heads, chewed pods in canola and legumes. And if you see those signs of damage, be prepared to bait early. The value of baiting early is that you're getting bait on the ground when there's not a lot of other food in the system and mice have got a good chance of A, discovering the bait and getting a lethal dose. Really critical that if you're seeing those signs, don't wait until you've got a catastrophe on your hands before you start to bait. Because as mouse numbers increase, they will increase very rapidly. And while those numbers are increasing, they will be knocking lots and lots of food on the ground that will be providing competition for the attention of the mouse for the bait. So make sure you get your bait out as soon as you possibly can so that we don't end up in the situation that we're in in the summertime where by the time we realised we had a problem with mice, there was so much sorghum on the ground that the bait was ineffective. As the crop continues to develop, continue to monitor, look for those signs of damage. But the key message then comes around harvest time once we get there is to harvest as clean as possible. The issue with seasons like this where we expect to put a really good crop in the bin is that often harvest windows are narrow and we push harder with the headers. It means we put more grain out the back of the machine. Anything that we leave behind in the paddock is food that sustains mice through the stubble phase and into the following autumn for mice to be present when you sow your next crop and potentially cause damage. So the cleaner you can harvest, the better you manage your stubbles, the less chance you have of mice causing problems when you're sowing your next crop. Um, and Scott, I think they're the key messages at the moment in terms of be prepared, stay vigilant, keep monitoring, bait early, and harvest clean. Excellent, thanks, Steve. Um, we're starting to get some questions coming through to the chat. So, Steve, you might just turn your attention to one or two of those that are coming through. 
Um, and a question that hasn't come through yet, Steve, but if you've got extra time in there, any advice you can provide about pasture management for mice as well, given the importance that it looks as though it's played. Um, and yet most of the conversation is around cropping and crop um, applications. So um, thanks, for that, Steve. One of our other key partners in the work that's being done both in monitoring and surveillance as well as in providing advice has obviously been the Grains Research and Development Corporation. Joining us from GRDC today is Lee Nielsen. Um, Lee from Lockdown Canberra, um, we'll throw across to you. I invite you to make a couple of comments. Thanks, Scott. I'm not sure sure how I can share my screen here. Oh, there we go. I just have um, a very brief PowerPoint slide or two to share with you. Please let me know that you can see this. Ooh. Is that working at all? Great. I don't think I can show it in full. Okay, so I just wanted to give a little overview that um, GRDC currently has over $7.5 million worth of investment in mouse management, and this covers all aspects of um, surveillance and management across the country, as well as research into understanding mouse biology, ecology and behaviour better to inform better management decisions. Um, given that zinc phosphide is the current, only the current um, available solution that we have, um, registered bait for use in crop. Um, we've also got investments to determine the effectiveness of this bait um, in the field and under alternative food supplies. Uh, we've also got investments in um, looking always for new rodenticides that could be brought to Australia or registered. Um, so we have a very diversified portfolio when it comes to um, investment in mouse management. Most of these currently are with the, the CSIRO as our um, research partner, and this is because they, can, they have the expertise and ability to undertake this research on behalf of the grains industry and in partnership with GRDC. Just wanted to draw your attention to our mouse management landing page, um, which is on the GRDC website. It's available by following that QR code there up on the screen or the URL just below contains a variety of monitoring and management advice, recent updates, all the resources that you can access and where to find out more information. It also links under the other resources tab to, um, to complementary resources available um, from government, local land services, etc. And I encourage you, if you have any uh, questions about GRDC's investments, to uh, make contact with me at the email address listed there on the bottom of the screen, or I will do the best to answer some questions today. Excellent. Thanks, that, Lee. Um, as you mentioned, one of the other information partners that we have is um, Local Land Services. I uh, know we've got a couple of um, uh, Local Land Services staff online, but uh, here to um, talk to us is Dave Witherden, CEO of Local Land Services. How are you, Dave? Yeah, th th thanks, Scott. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And look, th thanks to the uh, Minister for uh, facilitating th this forum today. I think, you know, a gr great time to get together, um, you know, with uh, our upcoming harvest. And I think you know, re really good to see um, the various organisations and government bodies together here. We've got a range of uh, sort of d different skills that really complement each other. And, um, you know, coming together sort of in this spirit of collaboration is excellent. And, um, you know, as we know, with um, most challenges in the ag sector, you know, the most effective results really rely on, um, you know, the effectiveness of uh, action taken at that grassroots level or, you know, on the farm. At Local Land Services, you know, we're lucky to have, you know, a range of uh, highly skilled and experienced people right right across the, the state. You know, we're in about 100 locations there, We've got, you know, our, our ag services staff, our biosecurity officers, you know, right across there and, you know, working really closely with, with producers and landholders. Many of them are actually landholders th themselves. So, you know, we're in a strong position to 
help and support people with, with that on-farm response and you know, connect people to the uh, latest advice. You know, we're lucky to hear today from Lee at the GRDC, Steve from uh, CSIRO, and, you know, we, we can connect you to, to that um, latest information and help translate it um, to, you know, I information that, that's relevant to you at, at your um, farm scale. Um, so, look, our people are out there on the road. They're regularly carrying out monitoring right around the place to get a good picture of uh, what's going on. Yet yeah, COVID certainly provided uh, some challenges with areas going in, in and out of lockdown. Uh, but, you know, we're always available over the phone, you know, using video calls. And, um, you know, we've we got people out, out there on, on farm e e every day. So don't hesitate uh, to, to connect with us. Each of the regions also have specific newsletters and, and social media there as, as well. So encourage people just to, um, you know, connect to us, you know, Google Local Land Services. We've got the um, mouse page there. It will connect you to everything you need. We also know that many producers, you know, it's not just about cropping or, or pastures have been mentioned. It's about mixed operations as well. So we pulled some specific advice together around that. Um, you know, managing mice in pastures, using livestock to effectively reduce food sources there. That information's available on our uh, website as well. In the Northwest region, we've been trialling a digital dashboard where landholders can fill out a quick questionnaire on the mice activity they're seeing on their property and you know, notify if they're experiencing any damage. Now, that only takes a few minutes to fill out I think we've had over 130 responses there and provides a really good uh, sort of snapshot there at that regional scale of what other producers are, are experiencing. So we'd be keen to um, roll that out uh, to, to other areas as, as well. Um, so, you know, look, at the end of the day, there is no one-size-fits-all approach to um, managing mice. So it really is important that you know, we all work together, you know, government with, with industry to, um, you know, utilise all of the available tools and control options there. And I think, you know, th this forum is, is a really uh, great step. So I'll leave it there, Scott. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Um, and very apt background you've got there, mate, um, with the uh, harvest um, looking over the horizon. Um, look, we might take a quick break from um, the speakers for a minute just to throw to questions and to bring the speakers we've had so far back into the storyline. So, Steve, just uh, warming you and your camera back up if we can. Um, and I, I might um, start the ball rolling because basically this time last year you were reporting moderate mice in Liverpool Plains area, but low elsewhere, and nil activity in sites around the Central West. Jump forward, and we know what that then led to in terms of the horrendous summer that we had. Um, jump forward to this report, and what I'm hearing is moderate to high activity, but patchy across Central West, high variable in Northern New South Wales, and patchy in Southern. Um, that's a serious concern for this time of year. Can I ask what, what's got to be done differently in approach this year to last year to try to avoid the calamitous outcomes that we saw in some locations last year? Look, I, I think the situation last year was uh, um, uh, a, a joining of a whole lot of factors that led to, to the mouse numbers getting really high. So, so we'd had a run of particularly dry years. Uh, we'd put one harvest in the bin that had that had generated a lot of food for mice. Um, and we were focusing really hard on getting a lot of fodder and a lot of, uh, and the next harvest harvested. And during that period, mice went from almost zero to really high really quickly. Um, they hadn't been a focus of attention because of that run of dry years. And 
because mouse numbers build up just so quickly. And, and you've got to remember that we're looking at, if you've got 100 female mice per hectare, you know, within 600, within six weeks, you're up over seven or 800 mice per hectare. So they go from, oh, geez, I've got a few mice at the moment, and they're potentially a bit of a problem, to a monumental problem really, really fast. And by the time we realised that there were, there were so many mice in the system, they had put so much food on the ground that baiting became basically ineffective. Um, and so, yeah, numbers got really big really quickly on us. This year, we're way better prepared. We've been talking about it way earlier in the piece than we were last year. Farmers are way more focused on it. They're out walking through their paddocks. They're looking for bait. Uh, they're looking for mice. They've been prepared to bait early, so they've got bait supplies on hand early in the piece. And you know, I don't think at this time last year anybody. Or sorry, yeah, I don't think at this time last year almost anybody would have been baiting. But now we've got reports of lots and lots of farmers baiting early, pushing that the number of mice low early in the season, and that's helping to take the breeding potential out of the population. You're muted, Scott. Thanks, uh, Steve. Um, mute button kills you every time, doesn't it? Well, sometimes it makes you sound smarter. Um, in my case, um, let me um, let me see if there's any questions that uh, people want answered in the Q and A bar. If not, one one of the key um, comments you made then was about availability of bait and people out baiting earlier. Um, what one of the um, assistance packages that I, that I didn't mention at the front end was actually the um, zinc phosphide import incentive scheme, which the state government put $5 million on the table for the five manufacturers to, of um, baits to help with the supply chains to make sure that there was enough active ingredient in the supply chain to make sure that we had what was needed on hand for this year. Um, we, we might throw across while we wait for um, Actually, sorry, we've got a couple of, uh, we've got one question coming up and that I was just about to throw to you, um, Colin Bell. So Colin, just get ready to come online in a minute. But in the meantime, Steve, you'll see a question come up there that said baiting early helps reduce populations. So is it baiting out with what you can get your hands on or is it wait to get the ZMP 50 um, if there's a supply chain delay or any lag time in being able to secure that, what's your advice on that front? Yeah, so our, our research from, from the work that we're doing in the lab and at Parks shows that you'll get a, a really good, reliable result more often with the ZNP50 bait. However, if you can't get supplies of that ZNP50 bait, I wouldn't be sitting around waiting for mice to eat my crop. There are times when you get a very good result with the 25 gram bait but we just can't guarantee that. So bait with the 25 gram if you can't get stocks of the ZMP50, but continue to monitor to make sure you've got the result that you're expecting to get. And if, if, that's the, if you get a good result, fantastic, but continue to monitor so that you don't continue to sustain damage. Yep. But again, we, we are recommending the use of the ZMP50 bait because of the results that we've been getting from the lab and in the field trials that we've done around parks. Excellent. And there's one more one here just before we do throw to Colin, which is your maps at the beginning showed a lot of reports of mice activity in grazing country. What measures can be taken in those areas? Yeah, gra grazing country is a tricky one and it's something that's just starting to hit our radar. And, and part of it is because we've been out on the ground seeing where mice are um, during the outbreak. Uh, and we're hearing more and more reports of uh, grazing or pasture country, uh, particularly after a run of dry years where farmers haven't been able to restock. And so there's, there's a significant amount of vegetation in, in paddocks and a significant amount of food from seed from those pasture seeds and those sorts of things and invertebrates as well. And we're hearing more and more reports of, of pasture being a refuge for mice and then 
as the food gets depleted in the pastures, mice moving back into adjacent crops and causing damage. Um, at the moment, there's no facility for controlling mice in pasture that, that I know of. And so our advice would be, if you've got pasture adjacent to crops, to endeavour to make those pastures as unfriendly to mice as possible. So if you've got enough stock to graze those pastures to a point where they're at least a little bit more open and there's less food and shelter available for mice, that would make a significant difference in those populations. But also be prepared to monitor those crops that are adjacent to mice, uh, sorry, adjacent to pastures, and be prepared to bait those crops um, if you see mice reinvading from pastures. Hi, thanks, Steve. Um, so, look, we might throw across now to Colin Bettles, CEO of Grain Producers Australia. Welcome, Colin. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me. Um, Andrew Wiedemann, um, who's um, heading this up for Grain Producers Australia, is actually going to speak to this issue in regards to supply. But I just wanted to say thanks to you and your department and to Adam Marshall as the Minister for your support in uh, working with us, um, GPA Overseas, the National Group at New South Wales Farmers is one of our um, key members to help deliver these um, outcomes to help support growers in managing the mouse plagues, uh, which as we know is a huge challenge and um, the results we're getting will help to optimise this year's harvest. But I'll um, throw over to uh, Andrew Wiedemann, who I'm sure everyone knows needs no introduction. Yeah, thanks, Colt. Thanks, Scott, too, and uh, for organising this uh, uh, today and also to Minister Marshall and, uh, and the team that I can see all the names have all been involved uh, this year in trying to make sure that growers right through New South Wales and into Queensland as well have been able to access bait when they need to. So uh, from my perspective, uh, we've been involved with the National Mouse Management Group from the inception. Uh, we actually helped to establish that group. Now, that group uh, is a technical group which supports the GRDC research uh, work that's required around this and, and was obviously a part of uh, getting Steve to do the research work on uh, why we've actually gone towards a much stronger bait. Uh, January this year, as a grower sitting on that committee with other growers, we heard the initial research which supported what we've been hearing and seeing uh, in some instances ourselves in paddocks where uh, the current bait hadn't been working as effectively as we thought it should. And so that research work has obviously been through the process, which led to us then working with five of the key manufacturers of the current zinc phosphide uh, registered product, Zinc 25, to establish an emergency permit uh, with the regulator uh, to bring forward the Zinc 50 product. The Zinc 50 product, uh, we feel, uh, will give growers the strongest possible bait uh, that's available to uh, growers anywhere in Australia and, and, and potentially even the world. So um, we're just supporting the research work that was done. In regards to supply, we've been in contact again only at the end of uh, last week with all of our manufacturers. I can report that some have obviously been supplying quite a lot of bait to the Western Australian situation at the moment, which has effectively taken quite a lot of bait uh, out of the system. But with the assistance of the New South Wales Government Grant Scheme, which I have to credit again, uh, the New South Wales Department and the Minister's Office for supporting uh, the manufacturers uh, and of course the growers through a rebate scheme, uh, which is unheralded. I don't know of any other state in Australia that's ever done that. So congratulations there. But look, in terms of uh, the availability, we have some manufacturers that have immediate bait. You could ring them now and, and the bait would be delivered uh, in the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. Others, it's a two to three week wait. Uh, and in particular, those that have been servicing uh, the local um, retail outlets, so the identified retail outlets in your areas, uh, they have existing contracts, obviously, with some of the manufacturers. And so they're not even aware in some instances, and we have started a process of contacting those manufacturers directly over the last three or four weeks to ensure that they're aware of other manufacturers that are, are available to them uh, that can supply immediate bait supplies. I should also mention that we have also uh, in the process of adding another manufacturer, Triox, uh, to, the, to the system. That hasn't been approved yet by the regulator, but we are hopeful that in, in the very near future we will see that. And so that'll add an extra manufacturer, giving us six manufacturers that can manufacture uh, the Zinc 50 product. So um, we're trying to cover all bases here. Uh, and as long as we can try and get uh, bait to growers, 
Uh, that's the important part from our perspective. So back to you, Scott, unless there's any other questions from the panel. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, and we might just uh, we might just hear and throw across to Peter Arkell from um, New Zealand's Farmers Association, and then come back around for any other Q and A's. I can see we're starting to build some up in the um, Q and A um, bar on the side here on Zoom. Uh, but before we do break back into Q and A's, um, Peter, I hand over to you. It's a really important discussion and a really key, key part of the year. Um, I think it's Steve mentioned um, farmers across New South Wales have certainly learned from the experience. So, sorry, Pete, I don't know if it's just me, but I can see from shaking of heads, um, having trouble hearing you actually. So, might just see can you get in closer to your mic there. That any better, Scott? Um, look, guys, I think uh, thank you for the, the updates and for the opportunity to um, to contribute to this really important session. Um, look, I think farmers across New South Wales have certainly learnt from last year's experience. And as Steve's touched on, we are seeing wide, widespread baiting activity uh, proactively across the north of the state. It, it is a key time to really hit these mice numbers hard uh, before the, the, the additional food is available in the paddock. So I think farmers have certainly... Uh, certainly responded to that call and that's uh, that's really encouraging to see. Um, we are hearing that the ZP50 product is is pretty hard to come by um, and potentially two to four four week um, delays on, on on accessing that 50 uh, 50 gram product. So um, just like the best COVID vaccine is the, the one that's in your arm, I think the best um, zinc phosphide product is the one that's being dropped out of a plane in your paddock at the moment. Uh, as grains, uh, grain, grain is going through that grain fill stage and we, we do have a chance to, uh, to, to hit these numbers hard, as I've said. Thank you to Minister Marshall for his work on the, the zinc phosphide rebates. And, and I note uh, Fiona Dewar from the Department of Regional New South Wales is also on the call. And uh, Fiona and the, the DPI team worked very hard to, uh, to get this generous government support package over the line. Um, New South Wales farmers certainly welcomed the package and we've, uh, been working with the Rural Assistance Authority uh, since the, the launch of the package to try and try and fine tune it to uh, to make it easier for farmers to access. And um, look, a big step forward last week was um, the addition of a, a letter from an agronomist or a supplier that that now does qualify to uh, to demonstrate that hardship for farmers to be able to to access the package. So. We're trying to make it easier for the, the rebates and the, the dollars to get out there into farmers' pockets so we can really uh, adopt that area-wide approach to, to really baiting mice in the, the weeks and, uh, and months ahead. So uh, I'd really encourage farmers to, uh, to reach out to the RAA to, to have a discussion. I know things are busy on farm at the moment. Everyone's short of, short of staff, um, a lot of pressure's on. So filling out paperwork to access a rebate's probably not uh, not a popular way to spend your time, but um, there is some some gener generous government support available. So I would encourage people, look, don't self-assess, pick up the phone to the RAA. Uh, the RAA is willing to, to work with farmers to, to ensure people do qualify. Uh, you can pre-register and then supply your receipts over, over coming months. Um, and the government's going uh, dollar for dollar up to $10,000 from the government to... Uh, to really invest in, in hitting these, these mouse numbers hard over the, the coming months to uh, really sort of avert what, what is looking like a pretty concerning situation uh, later in spring and into summer. So uh, thanks for the opportunity, Scott. Um, yeah, and welcome any questions from a New South Farmers perspective. Excellent. Thanks, Pete. Um, now, before we throw it open to um, uh, some Q&A again of all the panellists, um, I might just make a point that uh, the $150 million in assistance that New South Wales government is making available, um, which is a significant amount of funding, and I'd echo Peter's call for um, to get the message out to producers to don't self-assess, um, make contact with RAA, see what assistance is available to them. Don't forget that um, prime producers are also eligible for the household and the business um, assistance packages that are available through Service New South Wales. 
I would just say, however, our preference in DPI is always to avoid the rebates required to alleviate pressures during um, uh, natural disasters or events by avoiding the events altogether. Hence, another part of what we're doing is actually we've invested just under $2 million in a research project with, that's been led by University of Adelaide, uh, looking at genetic biocontrol and accelerating the research into genetic biocontrol of mice. Uh, testing ways of disrupting their breeding uh, and the breeding cycle, uh, things like eliminating sperm carrying uh, to the X chromosome to produce more male than female offspring, trying to breed in genetic infertility, um, continue to invest in those long-term solutions that aren't going to provide any assistance this time around. But let's hope if the cycle, and I think Steve, you talk about a 10-year cycle with big mice plagues, Hopefully we've got new tools that are more effective um, and able to be deployed earlier um, in the future off the back of research that's being done. Um, so let's jump to the questions and the um, question and answer chat. And, and look, I guess one of the key ones, I don't know who wants to tackle this one first, but there seems to be quite a conflicting message around um, zinc phosphide 50 um, availability across suppliers. Uh, we're getting some people in the chat saying that they've been told that there's um, at least a four week wait in their area. Others are saying that there's no problems in terms of availability. Anyone want to tackle the uh, question of where do people turn to if they're having problems with supply? Uh, yeah, you're there, Scott. Andrew Wiedemann here. Um, look, can I answer that directly? Because, um, you know, clearly we've been in contact and the bait uh, and the Zinc 50 product is available through um, our permit. Again, you know, we do have manufacturers, not all manufacturers have bait ready to go right now. So I think this is um, part of the problem that, again, the information that's coming through is coming from the uh, retail outlet and not actually straight from the manufacturers themselves. So um, if we can uh, facilitate, if people want to, uh, they can give us a call and um, we'll set them up with the manufacturer. Simple. Um, so we've got some questions coming in around control for other than broadacre cropping enterprises. So just to sort of uh, give everyone a heads up and you can start to select which area you're going to comment on. But we've got protective cropping slash glasshouse greenhouse operations, control options um, available for there. A lot of questions starting to come through with regards to damage and to fodder in forage um, storage stockpiles and best approach for control in, in those environments as well. Um, Steve, you've come off mute, eager to get into this one. <laughs> I'm not sure about eager to get into this because it's becoming a bit of an intractable problem. Um, so in terms of the use of zinc phosphide, it, it's registered for use in broad scale applications. So in a, in a paddock scenario, um, there is some limited scope for it to be used around um, fodder storages. I'm not 100% sure of the actual regulation around that. We saw last year monumental damage done to fodder, and I heard reports of damage inside greenhouses as well. Um, for protection in bait stations around greenhouses, my understanding is that the, the only products that can be used are the anticoagulant baits um, or those baits other than zinc phosphide. In the short term, the best control strategies for fodder storages would be physical barriers that we can think of. And so, you know, metal barriers around hay sheds that would prevent mice accessing those, those areas en masse, creating again, an unfriendly environment for mice in those areas around hay sheds, mowing grass, reducing cover, making the area around those hay storages as unfriendly for mice as possible. If you've got haystacks out in paddocks, then baiting in the paddocks around the haystacks, not immediately, you know, great thick rows, still baiting at one kilogram per hectare in the area adjacent to the haystacks, um, is the best way to reduce the numbers that are accessing the stacks. 
So haystacks are something that's only really just started to come on the radar as something that 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 has been significantly impacted by mice. Last year, we had farmers endeavouring to protect haystacks by burying them, covering them up with with tarps. So there was a whole range of things that were applied. Some of them were, worked better than others. None of them were particularly satisfactory. We've had a very short-term project to start to look into this as an issue. We would like to do more work on it, particularly in the area of contamination and health risks for livestock and humans. Um, so there's, a, there's an area of research that we'd really like to tackle there. Excellent. Um, Thanks, Steve. Anyone else want to add anything to Steve's answer there? No? I, I might just, uh, Steve, I, I don't know whether you're aware of this, but um, all of the state and territory DPI equivalents actually have a meeting with the Commonwealth on Friday to actually talk about a fast-track investment in R&D for new areas of research into mice and um, also into surveillance and monitoring, because I see a couple of questions come up in here around um, the breadth of the surveillance and monitoring across the state and why does it appear as though there's only a focus on it in the lead into play gears um, when the past we used to have it pretty widespread uh, across the state. So I know that um, now that we've got those dots appearing more rapidly up in Queensland and across in WA, there's a, a whole Commonwealth approach now looking to be brought to the table to bolster surveillance, monitoring, as well as research into new areas outside of just the current research that's looking at broad acre cropping. Yeah, and I guess one of those issues is that the, the periodic nature of mouse outbreaks means that focus does decline in, in years when we don't have, have mouse numbers and the capacity to keep looking for mice when we're just recording zeros um, starts to, to tail off. Uh, and then when we do get that, that outbreak at the end of a, a, a period where there haven't been mice, um, we then get in the situation of, of, of why weren't we warned and why weren't we looking more. Um, excellent. So just wanted to see if there's any more questions that come up and now going to go into the risky area of saying, I can't see more being typed up. So has anyone in amongst the 200 people online got a burning question that they just prefer to raise their hand? That's the little click button down the bottom of your screen rather than physically raising your hand because I can't see everyone on screen um, to ask any of the participants. Uh, Eric. We might just get you to come off mute, Eric, and um, introduce yourself and then ask a question. No, unless it's just me frozen. No. Uh, we'll keep trying to get Eric to come through. In the meantime, anyone else with a question? No? Scott, Scott if, I, if I might just make a comment as a grower. Um, unfortunately, in Victoria, we've experienced so many mouse plagues, I can't remember when we didn't have a mouse plague to some degree, um, or we've had to bait for mice, other than probably this year. But 2010-11 was the last uh, or the largest mouse plague that we have experienced in uh, Victoria, uh, and it took out quite a bit of the Mallee and South Australian Mallee. And for a lot of us at the time, uh, we didn't understand what a spring mouse plague could actually do. I've still got photos uh, from Mallee people that had sent to me where they were looking on one side of the paddock and uh, it was minimal damage, but when they got to the other side of the paddock, it was completely wiped out. Um, mice do significant damage uh, in anthesis uh, process for particularly wheat. They nip it below the head and, and, and do it a lot of damage. Um, at that time, we organised planes to fly over canola um, right up until basically maturity and windrowing, you can get enormous uh, damage in canola. So. You know, it is uh, very much, as Steve said, is to bait early. Signs are there, bait early. Um, 
it's uh, couldn't, couldn't be any simpler because the experience from that year was that where we did, um, we did uh, do quite well in terms of mouse control uh, and also help control the mice uh, as, as the harvesting procedures occur as well, uh, which can also cause problems, particularly in windrow crops um, and harvesting at night with mice. So uh, they're just a few little quick take home messages. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Andrew. And I can see um, uh, very sprightly looking Peter Arkell has got his hand up over there, although he's a bit of a dog going on the floor, Xavier Martin, I think. So either, I don't know if it's Peter or Xavier, um, throw to you. Yeah, thank you, Scott. And I might just turn my camera off because I'm a my notorious Telstra service. But look, one thing, uh, you've covered off a lot of good stuff, uh, but the issue around uh, availability of ZP50 versus ZP25, uh, appreciate there's a potential for suppliers, stockers, for sales agronomists to be talking their book, but um, I'm getting real feedback from members saying, particularly those that have had a good result out of ZP25, saying, where's the data on this ZP50? So there's a concern there, and I think a liability around those involved, whether it's DPI or JRDC or CSIRO, uh, to get that data out there because if it's good, it needs to be demonstrated. And if it's not, you know, I can just feel it that there's a developing uh, concern around the product and the method and approach. And I don't know how to answer those inquiries. All right. Thanks, Xavier. And um, Steve, because we have had a couple of questions around the research that has been done. Just want to make a quick comment about where that's up to and um, where people can and when people can track that down. So we we've provided um, a, a presentation to all of the bait producers um, when we um, decided to go public with this research, um, and it was that data that was provided via Grain Producers Australia to the APVMA that led to the issuing of the emergency permit. So, so the uh, APVM may have seen all of this data prior to publication of the, in the scientific literature, and they were satisfied with the rigor of the data to, to then issue the emergency permit. So th that's the first part. We're now in the per process of writing up the scientific papers. Uh, the first of those papers will be submitted to a journal in the next couple of days. And when these papers are submitted, they will all of the data from those papers will be made available to the public through a public portal. So in the next month or so, all of this data will be available. It's all been independently verified by independent analytical labs in terms of the doses that we provided to the mice. The bait that we used in the trial at Parks was provided by a commercial bait producer. And those baits have also been anal analysed by an independent lab to confirm their veracity. So all of this work has been double checked. Our results have also been double checked by independent mathematical modellers. Um, so we've gone through a very rigorous process to make sure this is all up to date and as uh, rigorously applied as it possibly can be. So these publications will be in the, pu in the public domain sometime in the next month or so, we expect. Right. Thanks, Steve. Um, thanks for the question, Xavier. Um, I, I think we've got uh, time for um, maybe one more question and uh, David Croft from Riverina. Yeah, g'day, Scott. Um, I'm just going to comment more than anything. I, my first mouse plague with the department was in 1969 at Trangy. For 40 years, I was involved in mouse plagues the um, North Star Cropper Creek episode where we had to import strychnine from India and, and bait 143,000 hectares in eight days really saw us uh, on our knees because we were the only country in the world using strychnine, which was the, uh, the catalyst to get zinc phosphide as our preferred bait. I think we really need to get back to uh, the local land services and whatever, providing a lot more monitoring early in the season. I um, mean, a lot of us have predicted these mouse, mouse plagues well in advance and th there's a lot of information out there that we could tap into. Thanks, David. 
thanks for the um, the call out there as to uh, past experiences. Um, I might just see, I, I, I don't know whether Minister's still on the line um, or whether he's um, helping with the setup with the um, vaccination clinic up in Moree there at the moment. Minister, are you still with us? Yes, I'm still here, Scott. Uh, sorry, I ducked out for a minute. They needed a hand, but no, I've been uh, listening all, all the way. Um, uh, thank you to you. Thanks to our panel and thanks everyone for, for taking part. There's been some really good questions there and some really good feedback, which I've, I've made a note of and, um, and we'll take on, on board to make sure that we're doing as government and government agencies, everything we can to uh, support you uh, now and uh, and over the, the coming season. So again, uh, thanks very much everyone for taking part. And as Scott said, uh, we'll double back to everyone that we've got your details with the uh, answers to some more of uh, some more detailed answers to some of those questions and, and any updates that we've got. Uh, and uh, we may well actually uh, run another one of these very soon, depending on um, on um, what what happens in in the coming weeks and months. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Minister, and thanks everyone for your participation. Thanks to our panellists for their time. Um, thanks for everyone's cooperation and collaboration over the last 18 months as we've been working our way um, through since the early indications back in um, March last year with regards to mouse numbers um, starting to build. It's been a collaborative effort across the field to make sure that we've got as many of the right tools, right information and right assistance um, available. Um, we will um, look to answer all the questions that we've got in the Q&A and in the chat here. Um, everyone's provided emails, so we will be um, flooding you with an email um, next, either later this week, early next week, with answers and summaries out of this discussion. Um, we'd also, as the season progresses, as the Minister said, we'll see whether there's um, a good reason to get everyone back online to either update on um, predictions in terms of populations and damage or on um, updates on controls or product availability. Um, in the meantime, um, if you have any other questions, I'm sure um, New South Wales Farmers, GRDC, LS, DPI, CSIRO, um, or Grains Producers Australia, all happy to take your questions, take any inquiries um, and help people out. Uh, make sure we get the right information out to those who couldn't make it with us this afternoon. I'm going to wrap up. Um, thank you everyone for this afternoon. Thank you for your time. Stay safe, stay well. Um, talk to you all later.